I, I guess I really want to know, what did you want these numbers to be? Because I know you want the economy to grow. At the same time, you got to get your arms around inflation. Are these good numbers, bad numbers, okay numbers? Well, absolutely. What we learned today is that uh, the Commerce Department estimates that in the third quarter, GDP grew about 2.6%. Uh, so that suggests that there is resilience, there is strength in this economy, even as the Fed uh, begins to, you know, the Fed is going through a tightening cycle uh, to, to tame inflation. So if we were to get under the hood, what we saw is that there is continued resilience in consumer spending, but it did ease. So that is consistent with what the Fed is trying to do. We also saw that, saw that businesses continue to invest, uh, but again, that is slowing as the Fed, uh, as we would hope. The big drag on the GDP last quarter was in housing investment. Again, that's the sector that we would think would be most sensitive and susceptible to the to rate increases. The big win or the big the big wind uh, in the growth of the GDP came from net exports. You know, we'll see how that gets revised. But overall, what this report tells us is that the economy remains robust. It remains resilient, even as we're starting to see the kinds of uh, cooling that I believe the Fed is looking for. Well, and that's my question. Can you have this robust a growth and get your arms around inflation at the same time? Because a lot of people are very concerned, as you know, about inflation. Yeah, absolutely. So we also got unemployment insurance claims today uh, that they remain low as well, suggesting that our labor market remains uh, quite low. This is an un this is an unusual economy, and we are we haven't had inflation in decades, but we also haven't had this kind of economic crisis. So I I, I believe we have to follow the data, and and we obviously try to look around corners. But these data suggest to me that we are seeing the kinds of cooling that uh, that we would expect to be seeing as the Fed increases interest rates. Uh, you know, we will see what happens going forward. We know that the global economy is fragile, uh, and but we also know that the U.S. economy resil is resilient, and we remain optimistic that there is a path uh, by which the Fed can tame inflation without generating too much pain in the overall economy. Uh, Dr. Ross, perhaps an unfair question, but we hear from you, we hear from your colleagues at the White House, we certainly hear from President Biden all the time about the various steps being taken to make sure we have a lot of employment. The employment clearly is doing very, very well. And also that we try to address some prices, prescription drug prices, things like that. And yet, if you look at polls, a lot of Americans don't have complete confidence in your management of the economy. Is that because they don't understand what you're doing, they haven't gotten the message, or is it a question about your policies? Well, look, I, I believe these policies have been uh, important to the American economy. It was uh, the Biden administration, President Biden's policies, that underwrote us getting through to, to where we are today on the pandemic. It put shots into arms. It gives households and businesses the resources to get through the pandemic. The three uh, signature le pieces of legislation that invest in our physical infrastructure, roads and bridges, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, the CHIPS bill, which has uh, in, is investing in uh, critical manufacturing manufacturing here in the United States. In fact, Micron is announcing a $100 billion investment over 20 years uh, to make semiconductors here in the United States. And that's happening almost every week here in the United States due to the CHIPS bill. And most recently, the Inflation Reduction Act, which makes an, uh, the historic investments in the transition to clean energy, which we know we have to make, also addresses key costs in prescription drugs and health insurance. So those are the kinds of investments that actually increase economic capacity, allows our economy to grow, which allows for us to absorb these kinds of shocks without generating inflation. So we understand, though, that inflation is too high. The president gets it. He's been working to get price, uh, gas prices down. So as a result, they've been coming down for the last three weeks or so. Uh, but we understand that that's partially due to the war in Ukraine, and we need to keep oil on the market. So we get it. It's Inflation is too high. But the president's policies have been uh, really are, have been important for maintaining the health of the American economy. Uh, Dr. Ross, you mentioned the, the Micron plan in upstate New York. We actually had uh, 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 Governor Hochul on last week to talk about that. I believe the president is up there this afternoon to address Correct. that issue, sort of north of Syracuse. A major investment. Uh, and goodness knows we've had a shortage of chips, although that seems to be turning around now. Increasingly, we're hearing from chip manufacturers, actually, demand is going down. And it raises questions, at least for me, about, I will call it, industrial policy. How, uh, are there risks in the government getting involved in things like making sure we have more capacity for semiconductors? Because those things can go up and down. 
Absolutely. So we understand we have to separate up the cyclical demand uh, from what is more of a longer term trend. But what we know is these kinds of semiconductors are getting used in more and more components. They are getting used in uh, components that are important to our national defense, and therefore there's a national security element. Uh, this is not about the U.S. completely cornering the market on semiconductors, but we know we need to have more capacity here at home. Uh, because we know that they are a critical input to so many goods that we all rely on. So we understand that the government, it, you know, picking winners and choosers is not, winners and losers is not always going to get it right. Heck, the private sector doesn't always get it right. But what we do know is that when it comes to ensuring and building in resilience, ensuring that we're building uh, the kinds of inputs, uh, maybe whether it be the transition to clean energy and solar panels or the semiconductor chips, which are so sensitive to so many components that we all rely on, we need to be making some here at home. They bring good jobs. It brings economic activity. It's an engine of economic growth. And by ensuring that many people, workers, can participate and benefit, we ensure that those that those that that growth is more widely shared. I'm shocked to hear you suggest the private sector doesn't always get it right when it makes investments. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's really shocking news. Let me, one more, if I could, on energy, because you, you've released some more from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. The president said he might release even yet more. Are you pretty much tapped out on that now? And what is the longer term plan for energy policy? And of course, a lot of it is driven, to be sure, by Russia invading Ukraine. But for whatever reason, we got a problem. So the president wants to use our strategic petroleum reserve responsibly. We've got about 400 million barrels that remain in it. Uh, but he and, and he want, he recognizes we need to retain it for the next un, unforeseen shock. Uh, but we also want to ensure that there is oil on the market. He is working with our allies around the world uh, to consider uh, opportunities and p uh, possibilities for a coordinated release or whether or how we might structure that. But importantly, he will use whatever decision he makes will be using the strategic the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in a responsible fashion.